and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, things to come if we can find out about them. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my regular esteemed co-hosts. Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hello, Alan. How are you? I am okay. How are things in Connecticut? Things are, uh, well, we may be getting uh, the hurricane here <laughs> in the next uh, day or so. So uh, Yikes. I'll, be looking, I'll be looking out the window while we're doing this. <laughs> okay, well, keep us posted. Um, I will. <laughs> and on the West Coast, we have Steve Marinucci, the world's only full-time remaining Beatles reporter. Um, you can read his work in Billboard.com, Axis.com, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Goldmine, you name it. And he is also the author of a book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hey, Steve. Hey, Alan. Hello, everyone. Okay. And this week we're going to do a show about films about the Beatles, and we will talk about that a little more after the sort of quick news overview. This week we have uh, really just a couple of things. Steve, uh, you want to talk about the What Goes On demo? Well, Thursday the uh, uh, demo of What Goes On goes uh, uh, on sale on eBay. And the interesting thing about this demo is that it it's not has nothing to do with the Ringo Starr version, but it's a John Lennon version that was done in 1963. They had actually planned to record the song uh, on March 5th, 1963, and, and uh, it didn't happen, uh, according to Lewis. And, but... Uh, they, when they recorded it in 65, um, Ringo was later given a co-composer credit, but he doesn't sing on this early demo, and it supposedly, according to what I'm told, has Lennon on acoustic guitar and Paul on harmony. Mm-hmm. So um, it'll be interesting if we get to hear it, um, and hopefully we might. Right. It's but, been uh, up for auction before, right? Right, 2012, and yeah. it went for... It went for uh, eighty five hundred dollars, just about eighty five hundred dollars, including buyer's premium back then. But um, but that the, also it, included another demo, didn't it? Right, uh, Granny Smith, the Granny Smith uh, uh, "Love You Too" de- uh, demo. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is just what goes this on. is just the what goes on. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious why. It, obviously, whoever has Granny Smith is holding on to it for another time which is i guess a good thing to do but uh it's yeah. too bad that they both won't go at once yeah or that and we never, they haven't leaked out in the first place right that, yeah that, that was the thing in 2012 they did not they, they did not leak out i'm, so we I'm told that um when it goes up on ebay on the 21st uh there will be a short sound sample yes so yes uh, there so that will be at least we'll get some sense of it, you know, however mm. many seconds. I hope it's more than uh, Mary B. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And it'll be interesting if the lyrics are the same or a little bit they're, different. They're, or what. different. they're different, I'm told. Yeah. Mm. Yes, the well, games people play. It's so funny. Um, yeah. Or the, yeah, 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 the recordings yeah. people play or the recordings people make. Yep. Yeah. So. See, now um, you got me curious about the Love You Too demo, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that, that was the thing. See, I was the one that found those uh, auctions back in 2012, and that was the amazing thing, that they were both completely, they were both not known to collectors, and they hadn't been bootlegged, and nobody knew what, what the hell they were. And we didn't get to hear them. And that was the, and they got, whoever took and got them, whoever bought them, took them and, you know, has hung on to them since then. Mm-hmm. So obviously one of them is coming up. It was the Harrison family, by the way, that sold them back then. Right. They were the, they were the ones that sold them in 2012. Yeah. Okay. You know, I like to think that these things will eventually come out one way or another, but there are a lot of demos and acetates out there that, like, we know of but haven't heard and uh, aren't 
soon going to be available, but I think uh, eventually they all will. I just hope we're all here for it when it happens. Right, you know? right. You know, right. sometimes people get these things and they use them – as ways to get other rare things, you know, by by not letting it leak out, they're sort of preserving the uniqueness and value of it, and uh, you know, for other sort of high end trades. But you know, eventually, eventually, it has to has to come out one way or another. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who, who knows? Apple might eventually put out some of these things. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Right. It was well, yeah. <laughs> April 4th. There was there was there was speculation that Molly B got picked up by the Harrison family. I mean, there's a, a, a guessing. Nobody knows for sure, but yeah, there was guessing that that would happen. And, and uh, so, mm-hmm. but anyway, it'll be interesting to see who gets this one. Okay, and meanwhile, um, Paul is back on tour, as we know, and mm. Ken went to see him what last night, right? Today is right at Madison Square Garden. So that would have been the 17th right. of September. So, yeah, it's, it was a great show. I mean, all of his shows are great shows. Hmm. I always enjoy seeing him. I always think it's a thrill and an honor to be in the room with him. You know, because let's face it, how many legends do we have of this magnitude left that's not only, uh, you know, going out there and performing, but giving you a near three-hour show? What I like about what he's been doing since the start of this new leg of his tour is that I think he's doing a little bit more shuffling around of the set list. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, he's not doing anything new. He's not doing any new songs that he's never done live before. Right. But if if you go to two shows in a row, you're not going to see the same show. And as we've said before uh, on this show, usually the second and fourth songs in a set list, he changes around a bit. The second song is either Save Us or Junior's Farm. You know, uh, some of the shows, actually, I think the first one that he did at Prudential Center, he performed Temporary Secretary, Mm. and I don't think he's done it since then. One of the shows, he did listen to what the man said for the first time in in two years, and I don't think he's done that since. Mm -hmm. Um, But you never know. I mean, I've looked at all the set lists, and... The changes are there in the second and fourth songs, and then usually in the encores, he does change that around. But I will tell you, and, and believe me, I don't want to have to say this, but I was really alarmed by his voice. Yeah, um, really? it, was very, it was very rough for me. Now, let me just point out one thing, just to be fair. <laughs> to my ears, I had a tough time through a good portion of the show with his voice, after the concert, I talked to a lot of fans there at the Garden, and they were telling me, best show they ever saw. <laughs> you know. And some of these are people that have seen him many times, so it could be from where I was sitting. Mm. You know, where, were you, where, were you, where were you sitting? I was 90 degrees, uh, 90 degree angle, left side of the stage, pretty high up. And I would see uh, Rusty Anderson playing throughout the whole show. By the way, you know, I really was able to see on the screen and watching him play and he did some tremendous lead guitar work in the concert Mm -hmm. but um you know just listening and and trying to focus on paul and sometimes it's difficult to hear paul because it does get to be a little bit echoey Mm -hmm. you don't know with the other band members when they harmonize sometimes the high note that you're hearing may be paul it might be abe you don't know for Mm -hmm. sure Mm-hmm. But um, there were times when when his he was really struggling to me. But I also <laughs> I was thinking about this as the show was going on. But I'm a New York Mets fan, <laughs> and I've watched. This has been a brutal year for Mets fans. But one of the highlights for the year has been uh, Jacob Degrom, their pitcher. Mm-hmm. And in one of the games that he he pitched, he didn't have his best stuff, but he still made it all the way through the game. And one of the announcers has, had said that sometimes you tell more about a player not when they have their best stuff, but when they don't and how they handle it. And the mere fact that he still put on a near three-hour show and still put on a really good show, there were moments there, especially, I would say, once the acoustic set started, he sounded great. Mm-hmm. He could work it out, sounded phenomenal. 
Mm-hmm. One of my favorite moments in the entire show, and I think I said this last year when I saw him, was in spite of all the danger. It just sounds really great as an acoustic song. Paul does this great acoustic solo in it. He sounds really good singing that song. He gets the crowd singing along with it. That's a real high moment of the show for me. Mm-hmm. He sounded great on You Won't See Me. There are certain songs, Let It Be, he sounded great on. There were moments when he really sounded just great. Mm-hmm. But he did struggle quite a lot from for my ears vocally. So, but it, I guess everyone's got their own opinion. There are other people there that saw the same show and thought that it was, you know, the best show or one of the best they ever saw from him. Yeah. Well, so, I, I don't think anybody would ever accuse you of being unfairly critical of Paul. So if he sounded bad <laughs> to you, it's hard to imagine who he sounds good for. But, hey, I you know... My feeling is that he just needs to he needs to somehow figure out a different approach, you know, um that where this voice will work, you know. Well, I, you know something, I was looking online at the beginning of when he when he started doing these shows, the ones in New Jersey. Rick Glover posted something mm-hmm. and he said best voice in the last 5 years. Huh. So I'm looking online, I'm watching some of the performances, and his voice sounds great. It really did in that first show. Hmm. And maybe it's the fact that he was well-rested. I don't know. And the thing is, he held, uh, well, he hit high notes, but didn't hold them that long. But still, fine. It's when his voice sounds rough. That's tough for me to deal with. And, you know, maybe I'm amazed is very tough for me to sit through. I'm very happy about the fact that he does four or five seconds, you know, because he wants to bring out the fact that he's not only going all the way back and doing in spite of all the danger, he's doing his newest stuff. And that song was a top 10 hit for him. Mm -hmm. But his voice is very rough doing it. But still, no matter what the bottom line is, he gives you a great show. And you can't ask for more from someone who's 75 years old to be up there giving his all for almost three hours. Right. And just the fact that he, he gets through this entire show, even when he doesn't have his best voice, you know, I admire him a lot for that, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that, that I noticed about this particular show is that he's getting more and more chatty with the audience. <laughs> he, he's talking a lot about specific songs, and grant you, they're the same stories that some of us have heard many times over, but he'll work in a new, a new story here and there, or he'll do an ad lib. Like, for example, apparently there are some fans who hold up a sign, and they're in, in the front rows there, and it'll say 110 or 112, and that means the number of shows they've been to. Yeah. And Paul pointed out one of them, and he said, we got a guy there in the audience that's seen me 113 times. And I'm thinking it's Rick Glover. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. I don't realize that it, it, that other people have seen him more than a hundred times. Yeah. But apparently there are some people who are doing that. And then he went and said, aren't you getting bored yet? <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. And then he said, um, this is kind of bordering on obsession. And that got laughter. <laughs> so when he does these little ad libs, I like that. Yeah. You know, and he's doing a little bit more of that, talking more and more to the audience. Oh, that's good. Um, so it's it's still an amazing show, you know. For me, way too much Beatles. <laughs> I really wish it would be spread out through the decades more. <laughs> I know a friend of mine said the same thing that I've been saying for years, which is that it's basically a lot of Beatles, a sprinkling of the wing hits that are the core hits that he's got to do, his new album, and very little in the middle. As far as what's in between, he'll do here today as his tribute to, to John. Not too much else. <laughs> mm-hmm. My Valentine, he put in there. Mm. I like the fact that he's still doing songs from new, although right. he'll probably take them out once his newest album comes out. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it's still a phenomenal show, and just to see that he has this much energy, you know, to entertain people for nearly three hours, to bounce around from bass to electric guitar to acoustic guitar to piano to ukulele, Mm-hmm. It's a phenomenal thing to witness, and the fact that he does it all without a break, yeah. uh, it's still a phenomenal thing to see. And, and still, anytime I see any review of him, everybody's glowing. You know, you don't really hear anything about his voice, and I think 
it's just that people appreciate the fact that we're dealing with a living legend of this multitude, and there are so few of them left, and it's so great that he's still doing this. And for that alone, it's reason to be grateful to go. So I think that's what you kind of take away when you see these shows. You know, someone like myself who treasures that voice, it's one of the greatest voices ever on record for me. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see it suffer like right. this. Sure. So, but that's just the way that I feel. But there were moments when he sounded fine. Let me ask a question, um, because your your comments about the about his voice go back to the sound in Madison Square Garden, and I'm not. I mean, I know his voice is is rougher than, now than it was, than it was, but and Alan, you can come in on this too because you've seen shows at Madison Square Garden. How does the sound in Madison Square Garden usually? It's usually okay. I mean, it, you know, it's 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 better than it was when I was a kid. Got to say that. I mean, there's you know mm. people have better amplification and. Uh, uh, I, I don't think you can blame it on the sound in the garden. No. But so um, the other night, Bruce Springsteen turned up. Mm-hmm. Yep. But nothing last night, eh? No. As a matter of fact, I was kind of thinking, well, it's Billy Joel's turn then. Right. <laughs> it's either going to be Bruce or Billy. Although I was secretly hoping that maybe Elvis Costello would turn up. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure doesn't he live in New York City? I think so. Yeah. He could be on, so, out on tour, though. So, okay, that's um, what I was hoping for. So, yeah, you know, and um, YouTube clips are plentiful on uh, Paul and Bruce, and uh, it was it was sort of good to see them doing. I saw her standing there, and uh, Steve Van Sant was there too, right? Right, okay. right. No, there's some great pictures of the three of them on the on the same microphone. Mm-hmm. You know, you love seeing that, you know, with Paul in the middle and then Bruce on one side and little Steven on the other side. So that's just such a great photograph right there. <laughs> mm-hmm. And this time they didn't get cut off like they did at Hyde Park. Right. So, right. So, and that was, it was kind of cool that in Hyde Park they did Twist and Shout, mm-hmm. which Paul never does. Right. Know? But still, it was a, a nice little surprise. And, um, you know, I'll be seeing Paul tomorrow night, Tuesday night at Barclays. So, you know, I may have something else to say. His voice might be better tomorrow. And I, I don't know. It could be hit or miss. Get some sleep, Ken. <laughs> right. Not at this time. I won't be. <laughs> okay. okay. And then I'm seeing him next week, too. So. All right. Woo. Okay. So shall we head on to the topic at hand? Let's do it. Okay. Do so, it. so the idea was that we were going to talk about Beatle films but not films starring the Beatles, so Hard Day's Night, Help, Let It Be, even Yellow Submarine and Magical Mystery Tour are out. And not documentaries, so no anthology, no complete Beatles, not even the new 50 Years Ago Today, any mm-hmm. of that. We wanted to talk about films about the Beatles, were inspired by the Beatles, and it seems to me there are basically three categories of that kind of thing. One is biopics, like, you know, Nowhere Man, Birth of the Beatles, which we're not talking about this time. You mean Nowhere, Nowhere Boy. Sorry, Nowhere, Nowhere Boy. Boy, right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm looking at it on a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Backbeat, which we are talking about this time. The The second category, I think, is fantasies, which would include like, you know, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, uh, which we're not talking about, but we are talking about I Want to Hold Your Hand, which is, mm. you know, takes off on, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a fictional story, but the Beatles are central to it. Mm-hmm. And the third one um, is parodies and satires, of which I can actually only think of one, which we're talking about this time, which is <laughs> right. the Ruddles, or as it is formerly known, all you need is cash. So, and there are so many of these things, though, at least in the first two categories, that I figure we can always have a second or third or fourth installment later on and catch up with some of those. But this time we sort of settled on I Want to Hold Your Hand, The Ruddles, and Backbeat, which turn out to be actually, I guess, my three favorites in this um, really? about, about okay. the Beatles genre. Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, there are others that are really good, too. And uh, when we get to those, it'll be fun to talk about them. But um, so which shall we start with? I Want to Hold Your, your Hand. Call. Your okay. call. 
<laughs> well, okay, then let's start with I want to hold your hand. That sounds like a good good idea. Okay. Um, and Ken, since you picked it, do you want to do some pontificating? <laughs> Okay, well, I have to say that a few weeks ago I watched this movie for the first time in ages. Mm. And generally, as a rule, I don't go for the the mania-type films on the Beatles where you've got the screaming girls and they got their hands on their hearts and, they, you know, and, oh, my God, I just touched Paul kind of films. Mm -hmm. um, but this is really – I was surprised that I actually – really did enjoy this yeah because many years ago i wouldn't have hmm. because the story itself is so believable right and the the characters play the role so well and you really feel for each one of them mm -hmm. and um i think that's what really carries this movie i love the acting mm -hmm. all together great uh, uh i loved eddie deason who is the ultimate you know nerd on film and uh, if this this movie came out in 1978, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So that was also the year of Greece, which Eddie Deason was also in. So mm. that was his year. <laughs> right. Um, I loved seeing the character that he played, the ultimate, you know, Beatle, Beatle nerd, Beatle geek. You know, mm -hmm. I know everything there is to know about the Beatles. And um, he played that role so well. Although, you know, it's kind of ironic that we're talking about this because... That character that he played in that film mm -hmm. reminds me so much of someone that just passed away, and that's Jerry Lewis. Hmm. Hmm. Very much like a Jerry Lewis character. Yeah. Uh, kind high of pitched manic. Voice. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 he played it perfectly. I loved the whole storyline. I loved having, um, uh, what's his name, the guy that imitates uh, Ed Sullivan. In, in the film. Will, jo Will Jordan. Yeah. Yeah, all that. There's so many clever things that were done in, in the movie, especially when one of the girls is in the Beatles dressing room and she hides underneath the bed, which apparently was a true story. And you don't get to see any of the, the, the faces of the Beatles, the actors playing the Beatles, but you see their boots. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it needs stuff like that, which I, which I think is very clever. You know, the whole storyline is, is a lot of fun. Um, the guy who was the boyfriend of one of the girls there, I, I like his character, although the whole story about him trying to ruin the Ed Sullivan broadcast by going up the, the TV antenna was a bit ridiculous. But overall, you know, I, I find it a very enjoyable film. Yeah, there were there were some ridiculous things uh, like there are lots of scenes where there is no traffic whatsoever on New York City streets. That wasn't you know that strained credulity, um, um, but it I, it was really funny. I really love this film. Um, first of all, it's an early uh, Robert Zemeckis film. Uh, mm -hmm. He went on to make Back to the Future and uh, and a whole lot of films that um, you know have done quite well and that everybody loves. But I think and he almost and he almost did Yellow Submarine in 3D. Almost. Yeah, that would have been a bad idea. But but this you know this was a lot of fun and I, I think you know maybe we should sort of just basically say what the plot was for people who haven't seen it. I mean, without you know spoiling everything but you know basically it's a, it's a bunch of kids from new jersey who uh you know there's a, a one girl is a total beetle maniac one of them is more interested in you know joan baez and folk music and thinks the beatles are just sort of a corporate you know thing to get you to not listen to real music and there's mm. a, a guy who hates the beatles is like a like you know he's based on i think one of those interviews you always see from Kennedy Airport of, you know, <laughs> the right. guys who hate the mm. Beatles. And they get into a car. Or they, they, they bamboozle one of their friends into taking one of his father's funeral uh, station hearses, hearses right. yeah, mm. into, uh, into Manhattan because they need to try to get into the Ed Sullivan show. And, uh, this is really all about their exploits trying to do that. And it, they uh, get into 
uh, the Plaza Hotel, uh, the, where the girl hides under the bed, is actually supposed to be in their suite in the Plaza Hotel. Mm -hmm. um, and they, there's all sorts of hijinks and funny stuff. And, uh, you know, Murray the K is in it. He's, yeah. He's a, uh, he's a little Playing old. himself. Yeah, he's a little old for Murray the K when he's in here. But, uh, uh, and Will Jordan, you know, one of the funny things is he's, he's imitating uh, Ed Sullivan and he's giving the uh, – the preview of next week's show and announces right. himself as a wonderful uh, <laughs> you know, uh, imitator. Uh, so yeah, there's just, it, it, it's just, I think very funny and I think very warmly done. And, you know, there's a scene in a record store in the beginning, one of the girl's father owns a record store. He's walking around in a Beatles wig. Um, but you know, when they show the discs and they show the labels, it's all, right you know and you kind of think okay so robert zemeckis either is enough of a beatle fan to know what the labels of the time were and what was out at the time uh, or he mm -hmm. had a really good consultant but my feeling was that this is sort of like at the at the time probably a relatively low budget film it was executive producer steven spielberg's Berg, so not that low but you know, I think it was. I just thought it was really well done and um, and and funny as hell. And uh, mm -hmm. so, Steve, I, I th this has always been one of my uh, one of my favorite movies, and I had not seen it in quite a while when I put it on uh, about a week ago, and uh, I it it all came back to me. I mean, it's the uh, that that scene in the record store that you mentioned was is like traveling back in time. Yeah. Um, you know, mm. I mean that was just a great a great the whole thing was very authentically done. Um, you know the mood the the mood of the the era was captured nicely. The kid uh, dragging the kid in the in the barber shop. Uh, I mean <laughs> that was, that struck a chord for anybody that grew up in those days. Sure, sure as heck struck a chord for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean the the scene in the hotel room uh, where the the girl who really had less of a you know less of an interest in the Beatles, you know, actually ends up. It, with the uh, pro most enviable position, she's holding. Was it McCartney's base? I can't remember. Yeah. It, I think it was McCartney's yeah. base. Yeah. And and she's actually really, um, let's put it, say, really enjoying it, <laughs> so, if I can say it that way. Um, she's, she's caressing it. A she's caress. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> and and it, you know the whole thing is just hilarious. I mean, it's just a. It's just. It, there's it's a very positive movie it's enjoyable from beginning to end you didn't mention mark mcclure mark mcclure played mm -hmm. jim elson in the in the first super in the chris uh, christopher reeve superman films my wife pointed that out to me i had not I, I didn't realize that and we were sitting there she's going that's mark mcclure from the superman movies and i go oh yes that you're right so um and i mean there's a lot of you know um Teresa Saldana was later uh, was uh, unfortunately uh, murdered uh, in year, later years, so that was uh, that's sad. But yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great movie. It really, it really, really is. Uh, it you know not just because it's about the Beatles, but because because of the the whole spirit of the era that it evokes, and the, the it's got a great script. And it, I, I I love um, uh, Wendy Jo Sperber. She's just mm. She's just absolutely awesome in that film. Uh, um, but the, she's also she's also no longer with us, correct? Right. You know, the great thing about this movie is that it 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 captures the era perfectly. The mood. I mean, anybody that lives through the era will recognize uh, the authenticity of the film, and that's what is really good about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have a question to ask the two of you about it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Obviously, a lot of the the guys watching this can relate to the story of the boy who's forced to get a haircut mm -hmm. from his father. But considering the fact that America only had a month here to even know about the Beatles, did they really have Beatle haircuts in barbershops back then? I mean, it seemed a little bit too soon for that to be starting. Now, you did it yourself. It's just that you combed it down instead of combing it back. Well, see, the the whole idea behind that scene was the kid was trying to comb it into a beetle haircut, and his dad wanted to take it away from him. He wanted to get, right. get a marine cut. Right. See, that was that was the idea of that scene, and that was the type of thing that 
kids had to put up with that their their dads didn't like them, you know, getting beetle haircuts. And barbers were especially condescending about that. The way that barber was, you know, tried to suggest um, almost that he, you know, kind of a, a gay thing there. You know, I mean, that's kind of the way it was. It was a very macho, t- a macho scene in those days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that that was kind of accurate. That was kind of accurate. So. Yeah, although my father never came up with tickets to the Ed Sullivan Theater when he wanted me to get a haircut, but no, same, <laughs> same, same here, same here. Yeah, no, I, I only wish that was the case. Although I lived a little further away from the Ed Sullivan Theater, I think than you probably did. I was in Boston then. So yeah, yeah. One of the things I liked about Eddie Deason's character and how manic it was was is the, that scene where they're trying to win tickets from Murray the K uh, mm-hmm. to get to the Ed Sullivan Theater. And the question is, who is the youngest Beatle? And he gets it wrong by saying Ringo, but he has, he has it all worked out. Yes, Ringo is the oldest Beatle chronologically, but he was the last Beatle to join, so technically he's the youngest Beatle. It's right. like, like that kind of argument, you know, like that was a great parody of a lot of the kind of arguments people or discussions people would have about, you know, taking his sort of almost Talmudic look at, you know, what, what, what some trivia question answer is. And, uh, I mean, that, was, that's so, that still goes on today. Yeah, <laughs> I know. So that was that was just so funny. I mean, there were there were just a lot of. If you haven't seen this film, folks, um, you really should, you know, find it. It's out on DVD. I don't know if it's still in print, it, but yeah, um, I, I believe it. I believe yeah. it is, and it's fairly inexpensive, uh, as mm. I recall. So, yeah, it's it's well worth picking up. You also notice that in some films like this one, they always put some beetle line in there. Yeah. Uh, make some reference to something to do with the Beatles because I remember there was one scene where one of the girls was riding an elevator in the hotel Mm -hmm. and there's an older woman who's looking at her and saying, oh, you younger people, you're all running about, all (laughs) helter-skelter. You know? Yeah, yeah. By the the way, it should be mentioned that, number one, there's Beatles music in this. Yes. uh, But also, they themselves appear in the film. Uh, I believe it's near the end when they when they get out of the car. I think that film is actually of them. I can't remember for sure now, but they are actually in the film. Well, plus so, the Ed Sullivan clips, or you can see the Ed's the on the monitors. Right. It's very well right. done because they've got actors on stage doing the moves from the show, but you see the monitors with the Beatles on them. And, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, this was before Apple decided that. Uh, uh, they were going to clamp down on people licensing Beatles songs, so their the recordings in here are actually the Beatles. So it's, it's mm-hmm. another another nice touch, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So shall so. we move on to another? I think we'll save the Ruddles for the end. So let's move. Yeah, on to I, was gonna, I was going to say that. Too. I was going to say that too. So backbeat, an Ian Softly film um, mm-hmm. with Cheryl Lee and Stephen Dorff. Let's see, Steve. Do you want to start this one? Sure. I I actually just watched this recently. Uh, I had not I, like uh, uh, I want to hold your hand. I had not seen it in quite a while, and I like this film. This is one of those fictional, uh, not fictional films, but I mean, it's one of these um, films that uses a lot of dramatic license to tell the Beatles' story. Mm-hmm. The and I, I'm going to I'm going to compare it to a film that we're not talking about today, mm-hmm. only because it covers the early Beatles, and that would be Nowhere Boy, where uh, Nowhere Boy, Boy was more of a character type of film and very 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 fictional. I thought this one was a little more authentic. I thought the script the script was is very good. I do think it. It goes probably a little too heavy on the on the blood, um, um, but um, I like this film a lot. I uh, I was I like uh, Stephen Dorff's uh, portrayal of John Lennon. Um, um, Stuart Sutcliffe. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Uh, um, who am I thinking of? Um, Ian Hart. 
Ian Hart. There, there it is. Yeah. I was watching. I was watching that that clip. Uh, I mean, yeah, he he plays uh, uh, John Lennon very good. In fact, he played John Lennon more than once, as I recall. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it, you know the it gets the music uh, down very nicely. You know the the music of the era mm-hmm. uh, of the the type that they played. The guys doing the the backup music are very good and include Dave Grohl on right. uh, Dave right. Grohl is is, on, is in there. Mike Thurston, Mills, Thurston, Thurston Moore, I think is another one. Um, you Mike know, Mills from REM. Right. Um, yeah. There's the the music. In fact, I always like the 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 soundtrack CD to this thing. Um, you know, it's always it's very enjoyable. There's there's a little bit of jazz. You know, the the jazz. Uh, theme but then once they get into the music uh it's you know it's it's very authentic um i think it's just well done it's it uh, the probably i think they could have played i think they smoothed Stu's character a little too much i would would have liked to have seen especially considering the way Astrid talks about him in the um, interview that comes in the special features on the second version, because this is actually, there's actually two DVD versions of this. And I don't, as I recall, the uh, Astrid's interview is not on the first version, but Astrid has a short interview uh, where she talks about Stuart and the description that she gives of Stuart does not entirely match what's in the film. You know, they made him probably a little more lovable than, uh, than he apparently was i mean she said that you know when she first met them they were very rough but still it's i think it's a good it's a good film it's very well done you get to see the beatles in in those days and uh, you know unlike for example birth of the beatles which we're not going to talk about i mean this is birth of the beatles was more of a cartoonish type of thing this is definitely a little more um hard-nosed um than that so anyway Mm-hmm. There, there we go. And it, this one, I, as I recall, this one was done without any, any Beatle um, backup. Whereas Nowhere Boy had the Lennon demo in it. This one does not. So uh, this one doesn't have any Beatles music, as I recall. Is that right? There, there is no. 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 Um, do they play uh, My Bonnie, or was that just the? They play. They did. They do play. You're right. They do play um, a little bit of my of the Tony Sheridan My Bonnie in there. But I, you, I, I'm trying to remember if you can hear the Beatles or not. You may, actually might be able to hear the Beatles in there, but they don't play any Beatles songs. They just play the Tony Sheridan My Bonnie. Right, and of course, at the time, there wouldn't have been really uh, those Beatles songs to play. I mean, most of the right. things that are recorded were written after this period right. of the film. I think they um, they did mess around a little with the chronology in order to create a, a, a bit of tension about Stu not showing up to the recording session. I think the recording session was done after he was well out of the group. Am I mm-hmm. wrong about that? I think, I'm, I think I'm right. And in fact, I think they even have my body coming out while Stu was still alive. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you know, I thought I thought it was well done too. Um, but for Ken, <laughs> I thought it was very well done. I mean, the thing kind of like what I said with "I Want to Hold Your Hand." I think the acting makes this movie, mm-hmm. and the two the two uh, the two actors that play John and Stu are very impressive and very believable, as far as I'm concerned. But it's to the point where the other Beatles are more like a backdrop to the film, and it's really the film. While it has a lot to do with Stu being in the Beatles and his role as a bass player and then uh, wanting to, to have uh, a career as an artist, it was kind of like more like uh, the relationship between John, Stu, and Astrid and kind of like a love triangle. Yeah. And there's this underlying thing of you know John actually being jealous of Stu when he found love with Astrid. Yeah, and uh, you know you're wondering where is the story going here. In fact, there is a fight there between the character who plays John and is it is it Paul, where Paul's kind of insinuating what's going on here with you and Stu. Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. And, well, there, uh, there's there's tension between John and Paul in several scenes because Paul wants him out, and so I mean that. But it, but yeah, there is that one there is that one scene where you know where he he does talk. 
about that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, there is one thing about this film that bothers me a lot, and mm. that is that I never, when I watch this film, I never get the idea that Stu really was not a good bass player. I mean, he plays well enough in this film. In fact, there's one particular scene where his fingers are flying a bit on the bass. And you really don't know what to believe after all these years. You've always heard that Stu really couldn't play the bass well, depending on who you ask. I mean, I've asked Pete Best this question, and he said to me, Stu was not a bad bass player. He wasn't a great bass player. He was adequate. But, you know, Paul was upset with Stu because he couldn't play well, and he wanted the band to improve. And um, and sure, um, there might have been some jealousy in the relationship between John and Stu as well. But, you know, Paul had high hopes for the band. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he was very conscious about that and wanting the group to succeed. Mm-hmm. And um, you just don't feel like when you watch this film that Stu is not a good bass player at all. It's more Stu has his mind on other things. He has his mind on Astrid. He wants to have his career as an artist. And so he's not really dedicating himself to being in the band. Right. Uh, but not but not that he's that he can't play. And yeah. you never get that sense when you watch this film that he can't play the bass. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know. In reading Lewison, there's 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 a much stronger feeling that Pete was a bad drummer than that Stu was a bad bass player. Hmm. You know, and there are different opinions about how bad Stu was. But I, I think. You know, the the fact that Stu did have his mind on other things and did want to be an artist and was not fully committed to the band is definitely something that would have irked Paul, don't yeah. you think? Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe that was more of it than his bass playing. I mean, who knows? You know, in, in those days, bass players were not Paul McCartney. You know, I mean, our idea of, mm. our idea of a, a, a great bass player, especially for the Beatles, is conditioned by the fact that he was really like a lead bass player, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but in those days, it, that wasn't necessarily as expected, which is probably why they gave him the bass in the first place, you know, rather than, mm. a, a, you know, another guitar or something. Um, because really any of the, those guys could have taken up the bass and Mm -hmm. just let Stu be another rhythm guitarist or something, you know, but, um, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, the, the, um, the love triangle thing, I don't think was like just an undercurrent. I think it was really overt, you know, I mean, Astrid says at one point, you're in love with Stu, basically, you know, the two of you have this thing and I don't think she meant it necessarily as like sexual love. I think it, you know, I think she's just sort of talking about how strong that friendship is, which also, you know, might've bothered Paul too, you know, Paul wanted Mm -hmm. to sort of get in there and be John's right hand man and, uh, Right hand man and steward he was and uh and wasn't committed to being a rock star, so right yeah we'll we'll mm-hmm. never fully know what totally went on there, you know i mean but mm-hmm. uh, but uh, i think I think it is a really good portrayal of that time and that place, despite the fact that there is a lot of license taken here and there, and the band is you know as you said, Steve, with you know Dave Grohl and all. Uh, and Mike Mills, all these people uh, playing in it. I mean, the band is really pretty hot, hotter mm-hmm. than the Beatles probably were in 1960. Right. Um, <laughs> one other point is uh, uh, is one of the cast members uh, that probably is hard to recognize, but it's definitely her, is uh, Frida Kelly, who plays Mrs. Harrison. Oh, uh, really? I didn't yes. Know wow. Yes. Yes, it's definitely because I, I I saw it. I was looking down IMDb and and I saw her name and I went, "You got to be kidding!" And I and I looked, and it's it's hard to uh, in the one scene. Uh, there's one scene where she's um, with the band or she's at the show, and uh, you can tell it's her. It's, uh, this is obviously much. You know, it's not like she doesn't look like she does now, but it's Frida. It is Frida. Huh. So well. See, okay. you can not only learn something from listening to this program, but even from being on it. <laughs> right. I didn't know that. Right. Anyway. Uh, you want, you want uh, the biggest piece of trivia? Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's the it's biggest piece of trivia? This, this falls under the, uh, the Kevin Bacon, what is it called? The seven degrees of separation, mm-hmm. or whatever. 
Well, Stephen Dorff is the actor who plays Stu Sutcliffe in this film. And his father is Steve Dorff, who is a music composer. And um, he's probably best known for um, writing the theme for the TV show Growing Pains. Hmm. As long as we've got each other. He also wrote a lot of songs in the country field, like uh, Through the Years for Kenny Rogers. Well, Steve Dorth also wrote a song with the songwriter John Bettis, who's also kind of known for writing songs, uh, say, for the Carpenters. Mm -hmm. Um, And they wrote a song together, which was recorded by Ringo. (laughs) And that song happens to be a movie song, which is called You Never Know. Huh. And that's a song that's in the movie Curly Sue with Jim huh. Belushi. So my point is that, uh, you know, the Dorff family there <laughs> have uh, connections to the Beatles twice because Stephen Dorff played Stu Sutcliffe, but his father wrote a song that Ringo recorded. Hmm. Oh, okay. Cool. There you go. Here's another Where else we go. you find out that information? Here's another <laughs> trivia question. Another, see, the, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you learn everything by, by uh, tuning uh, into uh, the show, yeah. um, folks. What was the French title of this film? A backbeat? Yeah. I'm afraid to ask. Okay. Pardon my French. <laughs> oh, okay. But Cinq garçons dans le vin. And, of course, the French title of A Hard Day's Night is Quatre garçons dans le vin. So this one is five, five young men in the wind, and A Hard Day's Night in, in, wow. in France is four young men in the wind. Hmm. So... That's funny. That's really trivia, right? That's like way down in the microscopic really? trivia. <laughs> really? Yeah, there we go. Someone's going <laughs> to yeah. use that, though. <laughs> Someone's yeah. going to use it. We'll have to give you the credit for that, though. <laughs> yeah. So have we, uh, have we exhausted Backbeat? I think so. Uh, well, I just wanted to say that um, Pete Best is not given a really good image in the in the. <laughs> That's, a, that's, a, that's a good has, point. He has like one uh, line. He has one right. line, and they're surprised that he even spoke. Right, that's right. <laughs> There's one moment when John said to Pete, "You don't say much, do you?" <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Pete, Pete was the one who, when John and Paul had that fight over Stu, Pete was saying, "Come on, guys, you know, break it up, you know." And and uh, George said about Pete, he spoke. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember. I remember that. That was uh, that was funny. Yeah. So. Oh well. There, there you go. Poor Pete. <laughs> Poor Pete. <laughs> okay, so on to the levity of the Ruddles. All you need is cash. Did everyone see this when it first came out? Yes. Yeah. I don't remember if I did or not, but I. It, but yeah. I, I, I think I might have, yeah. yeah. I think I did. I think this was also 1978, so the same year as I Want to Hold Your Hand. Mm. And um, so who wants to start? I can start. Yep. Um, if, if, there's a, if there's a, I mean, in contrast to I Want to Hold Your Hand, which is inter- purely entertainment, and Backbeat, which was a, dram- a dramatic portrayal, the Ruddles is is inside jokes. is is um, is a lot of is satire, but it's inside jokes right. uh, from within. It jokes from within that apparently, I guess John Lennon liked so much he didn't return his the copy they sent him um, to to check it out. Um, what's I mean, a, a lot of people, the, ca- the casual viewer, as I recall, the 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 original broadcast got horrible ratings. I think it was actually it dead did. last. It was it dead did. last, and you can kind of understand that from the from the viewpoint of the average viewer who's looking at this and going, "What the heck is this?" Because there there are so many inside jokes, but mm. Beatle Beatle fans will uh, absolutely love it. I mean, there are. And that's the funny thing. I mean, there are inside jokes all, you know, all through it. Um, you actually have one of the Beatles involved in this thing. I mean, they they poke fun at everything. The uh, actress who does the uh, Yoko Ono um, character, or the, was supposed to be Yoko Ono, is 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 actually that's actually very uh, edgy. I, I guess that's the way to put it. You have a future U.S. senator in the cast. You have uh, um, Al, Al Franken, Al Franken. Uh, 
you have, I mean, half the, most of the Saturday Night Live cast is in it. Um, I love the, the Bill Murray, Bill Murray the K character. I think that, that is, actually, compare that with the, with Murray the K in I Want to Hold Your Hand. And it's, it's actually, it's, it's like, you know, the two are almost identical, pretty much, the way they go over, over the top. Um, mm. You know. The uh, Alan Klein character uh, by John Belushi is is hilarious. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. There's, I mean, uh, Dan Aykroyd's in there. Gil- Gilda Radner is in there. Uh, there's just so many. There's so many moments. Eric Idle, of course, is tr- is hilarious from beginning. You know, at the very beginning. Uh, and know, also, oh, of sh- also you have ahead. Bianca Jagger as. Uh, That's Paul actually, McCurdy. you know, what? Yeah. right. And I was looking, and when I was watching this, uh, I was going, you know, that's one of the part. That's one of the moments in the the film that never gets mentioned. But it's actually one of the better. She's one of the better characters. She's uh, she's eyeing. Uh, she gives you know she gives him the uh, uh, the nasty the, the skank eye, and she you know and she I, she's great in that thing. I mean, she's yeah. absolutely wonderful. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it. You know, there's just so much. You know, there's so much here to like, but you have to be able to appreciate it, and not everybody's going to be able to. Uh, and the music, of course, is another story. The music parodies are great. Uh, uh, you know, and they actually left out, uh, I guess, Blue Suede Schubert. Uh, it's uh, one of the deleted scenes in the in the on the DVD. There's actually another scene that's uh, on the deleted scenes. Uh, with Roger McGough, and and that's in the that's in the film, and I don't know why they call it deleted, which is actually one of the funnier scenes uh, yeah. with, uh, with, uh, with 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 that one is, but I mean, there's just so many moments in this thing, but you have to be able to appreciate it. It's not something for a general audience. It, it's you know, this is a inside joke. It, it's yeah. nine minutes of inside jokes. It's really what it is. Yeah, it's but, it's definitely something for anybody who'd be listening to this show. I think, right? right. Oh, yeah. And I'd be surprised if that many people hadn't seen it actually. Listen to the mm-hmm. show. We should mention that they did do a sequel, and the sequel doesn't even measure up to to. Uh, and I actually have not I, I have not watched the sequel nearly as much as I've watched this, but the sequel uh, didn't get very good ratings and uh, i think most people just didn't didn't like it hmm. so i need to watch the sequel more i only saw it once but they relied on some of the same jokes right that, were in no, the first. that, that was the, that was the problem it wasn't really a continuation hmm. it was, yeah. was more of a a, a resurgence or a, a, you know a regurgitation of the first one which was really too bad but okay so ken the ruddles is one of the most brilliant things that has ever been done on the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And I can only speak <laughs> glowingly about the Ruddles because the, the unfortunate thing, kind of like what Steve says, you have to know the history of the Beatles to fully understand it. And even after you've watched it once, there are things you pick up later on that you didn't see the first time. And, um, I'm a big fan of Saturday Night Live through the years. I will always have a strong affection for the first five years of mm-hmm. who the cast members were, and most right. of those players were in there. I love Gilda Radner to death to have her in there, and Dan Aykroyd, and John Belushi as Alan Klein, and it was that whole scene is so perfect there with him, you know, that that menacing, you know, walking down the the hallway there with this with his hat on, you know, like this mm-hmm. you know, mobster yeah. kind of thing. The Bill Murray, the K bit, that's like one minute that Bill Murray is in this thing and he steals the show. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, he's so perfect in that role. And, you know, talking about their trousers bit, which is, you know, a running joke throughout the the story there. Right, right. So many brilliant things. I love, um, you know, there's the scene in there of the, the elderly black couple where the husband always claims that he started every single band that's out there. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I love it. Every time somebody new comes on the scene, he claims he started them. That kind of thing. I love that. It's just so funny. <laughs> yeah. The whole business about when Eric Idle interviews uh, the Queenie Epstein character and, and – you know, what did Leggy Mountbat- Mountbatten find in them? And, you know, and she's saying, you know, it was the trousers. 
you know, left nothing to the imagination, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. Eric is looking embarrassed, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's and of course, there's all the music too. The music is beyond brilliant. Um, I think it takes a certain skill to not just write a song that's in the style of the Beatles, mm -hmm. but for it to be so very close to a certain song, but making a little slight difference to make it a different song. I don't think there's anybody that's more skillful at that than Neil Innes is. Right. I mean, I've said many times that how close can you get between Get Up and Go and Get Back as a song? Yeah. And they're two different songs. Mm -hmm. And it's it's... I don't think it's as easy to do as people might think, you yeah. know, um, there's, there's so many things, you know, uh, they're all just it, great it, songs it, too. I mean, you know, I, you could listen to that album and, and it's, you know, it's funny. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not just that it's a very close Pe Beatles parody. It's just really well done. I think musically as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I thought was probably, the most brilliant thing of them all, of this of of the Ruddles, is that the character of Stig O'Hara, the quiet Ruddle, <laughs> doesn't say one word <laughs> in the entire, you know, documentary. Not one word. Even when they're doing the equivalent of uh, when when Brian died, yeah. when Leggy took a, a teaching post in Aust was it Australia. <laughs> Something like that. And they're, they got the cameras on the Ruddles. Stig doesn't say anything. And yet the real George Harrison does. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, he does. Yes, he does. By the way, the, the character, the, who, the woman who you mentioned, the woman who plays Iris Mountbatten, which I love that. Uh, the, I love her, her uh, uh, speech at the beginning. That's the same. The same actress plays the Yoko Ono character, Chastity. It's the same woman. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That, that, that's 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 pretty uh, pretty wild that she played both parts. But anyway, go go on, Ken. I don't know. It's one of those things where, kind of like Beatle movies, you can quote it so many times. There's so many great lines throughout. Oh yeah, um, right. You know, it's it's just absolutely wonderful. It, it was way ahead of its time, as far as I'm concerned. And you really have to know the history as the guys who put this together did. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, nothing but kudos. For, for the Ruddles. And it's funny how the Ron Nasty character has lived on outside the movie. It, it really has. I mean, I, you know, I've known, you know, many people that have taken that pseudonym, but I mean, it's, it's, it, you've seen the Ron Nasty thing get mentioned in more, you know, in more places. You don't hear your, you know, you don't hear uh, uh, any of the other. You don't hear Dirk or uh, or Barry Womb or Stig O'Hara getting mentioned. But I've seen Ron Nasty's name. That name fit the John Lennon character just perfectly. Mm -hmm. So, mm. and there are some there are some actually really kind of wicked parodies. I mean, the the scene right. of. Uh, uh, Eric Idle and Bianca Jagger, and he's writing, uh, you know, a love song that is so inane <laughs> and banal <laughs> that uh, you know it's 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 almost painful. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, yeah, the Dirk McQuigley character is not that flattering to Paul McCartney. No, no, uh, especially no. when you see him on stage and he's batting his eyes, oh, his eyelashes, it's like right. really feminine. You know, it's like that's really overdone. He even he also, I think, he does the uh, pillow hands thing at one point too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. he picked up a lot of Paul's things, and um, but you know, I mean, this is what satire is. Yeah, you, you, it's like a roast. You know, you have to. Um, I, I I wonder what Paul thought of it. I mean, George obviously, I think, liked it. Uh, John liked it. Uh, Paul, maybe not so much. I'm not sure if, if Ringo ever voiced an opinion either. Um, I have a few um, things that nobody's mentioned. Um, one is that the American and British prints were a bit different. And in particular, I'm thinking of one scene, the one that Dan Aykroyd is in as um, the guy who turned them down at DECA. Um, in the American one, they say... Uh, Eric Idle's interviewing him and says, so how does it feel to be such a jerk? <laughs> and in the, in the British one, which is what's on the DVD, he says, how does it feel to be such? And he mentions a uh, 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 lower body part. 
Uh, ah. If we can say that. So it's a you know, different edit. And uh, the, here's another thing. It seems to me that the best way, really the best way to watch this, is to first watch the Tony Palmer film, All You Need Is Love. Because hmm. although it's not exact, it is really close to a cut-by-cut parody of that film. The sequence of events, I mean, the Ruddles um, has a, a lot of stuff that, you know, of its own that wasn't a direct parody of the Palmer film. But the progression of the Palmer film and the progression of this are almost like mirror images of each other. And I kind of think that when they made this film, they had the Palmer film in mind as one thing they were parodying besides the Beatles story. Hmm. That particular telling of it. Hmm. Um, Mm. Okay. So try that this week because that's out on DVD too. And, right. Uh, yeah. Palmer stuff is weird. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Some of Except, it. Some of it. Some of it. That one I I thought was pretty good. I mean that was that was on a um a PBS series which was all called All You Need Is Love that went on for right. weeks and weeks. And when I first got my very first VHS machine, and I guess around seventy eight. Um, I taped that one episode because it was the only one that had Beatles stuff in it and, and watched it all the time. And then when the Ruddles came out, I'm thinking, well, you know, <laughs> it's kind of close. Mm. So, uh, yeah, um, because the, the Palmer would have been made, you know, a few years earlier and they would have seen it. They it would have been really fresh right. in their minds. But Do you yeah. know if they used it as a reference or – if they were influenced by that? Um, I've never heard them say it, but it just seems to me watching the two together, which I've, I've, I have watched them back to back, um, and it seems to me sort of inescapable. But um, mm. And even the title, All You Need Is Cash. Right, you know? right. That's uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's absolutely, uh, that's very likely, yeah. I think they also did a, a great job with the other rock star interviews that they got um i and it's hard to tell whether those were scripted or ad-libbed but because the, there are jagger um and i think paul simon interviews in the outtakes and they're different mm. from what's in the film i, I kind of think they let them ad-lib and i thought they did a really good job moderately straight face not entirely jagger is kind of cracking up but i think yeah um but uh yeah, you know, and you guys have hit a lot of the other things that the SNL cast, the combination of SNL and, uh, you know, Python, uh, uh, Bonzo. <laughs> um, hmm. it, it just was a, a, a great idea and a great production, and um, it really stands up. I mean, I, I watched all these films within the last couple of weeks because I knew we were going to talk about them, and so it was a good excuse to see them again. And um, I just never get tired of the Ruddles. Me neither. I yeah. can always go back to watching it. There aren't many, you know, films on the Beatles that I could watch repeatedly, but this one definitely. Yeah. 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 So okay, that was a I think a, a a fun look at three of the many films about the Beatles, and it's a topic I think we'll return to, uh, you know, at some point again because there are so many of these films. Um, not quite as entertaining as the Ruddles necessarily but um but definitely worth checking out and if shall we, shall we suggest that if uh if people want us to yeah. talk about a certain film that they let us know yes i was just about to do that steve i'm sorry i'm, I'm sorry go, <laughs> go ahead and say that then no you said it it's fine Doesn't okay matter. we we think alike the three of us more or less yes. uh, <laughs> more or less more or less spread across the country as we are Right. Um, so yeah, you know, feel free to write to us if there if there are ones that you want us to sort of move up the list. Maybe um, I think everyone has favorites and unfavorites of uh, these things. Just you know, don't make one of the ones on your list Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band because I. Oh. Oh. Okay. We Whatever. Should. I mean, it's now coming out on on Blu-ray. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll we should talk that. about it. <laughs> okay. Have you? I, I, no, I, I think we've talked about. It. You haven't seen this, have you, Alan? I've or have ne you? I've never watched it. I have it sitting on my shelf for for years and years. Um, I had it on VHS for that. 
I've never watched it, and if I can get away with never watching it, I will continue to do so. But we'll try. We'll try and spoil but, that. But <laughs> but for you guys and for our listeners, I'm willing to take the proverbial bullet. Not really the real one, but the proverbial one. I can I can handle. Um, There's probably a lot of films that we haven't seen for a very long time, or maybe have never seen. But yeah. if our listeners suggest some of these, it gives us reason to go and check them out yeah. or revisit mm-hmm. them. So, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we'll go around and just uh, give everyone a, a sort of the addresses of where they can write to us about these things. I mean, first of all, there's the group address. You can contact us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we all read those and we sometimes respond directly. Sometimes we'll, you know, just take your suggestions and run with them. Um, we have a Twitter account. It's, um, at things we said fab on Twitter. And we have a Facebook page, things we said today, Beatles radio fans on Facebook. And Steve, how can people get in touch with you? At BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I also have my own Facebook page, and I, I, that's my personal page where I post Beatles and other stuff. But the, my uh, uh, on uh, my Beatles news and information page, it's all Beatles. So there you go. Okay, and uh, I'm easy to get. It's just um, on Facebook, Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And Ken, over to you. Uh, my email address, every little thing at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I should also say that um, this morning I had the chance to interview Bruce Sugar, who is the engineer on Ringo's new album and actually has been working on Ringo's albums as far back as Ringo Rama. Mm. That's quite a long time ago now. So um, that interview is going to be up on my website later on this week, probably by Thursday or Friday. I'm hoping to have copies of Give More Love, Ringo's new album, to give away on my Beatles trivia and games page. And that should be momentarily. So if you can, check out the website. Again, it's KenMichaelsRadio.com. By the way, speaking of Ringo's new album, just want to send a shout out to Chris uh, Dimitrio, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He sent us an email and he wrote, thanks for alerting me to the new Ringo album. I wouldn't have checked it out without your positive reviews and I have to agree, it's a really solid and high quality album. Thank you, Chris, for writing in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. thanks. So, um, I think that is it for this time. So, for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci, this is Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.